John chapter 1, verse number 29. When you find your place, would you shout a big amen this morning? John chapter 1. If you said amen, even if you didn't, would you stand as we give reverence to the reading of God's word? John chapter 1, verse number 29. What is taking place here in John chapter 1 is John the Baptist is preparing the way for the Lord Jesus Christ to come. He is the one in the wilderness who is preparing the way of the Lord. He's preaching in the wilderness, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he is, uh, uh, he is setting the table, if you will, for the Messiah to come. And so he's baptizing uh, there in, in the, the river Jordan. And w- when we come to the place of verse 29, notice what the Bible says this. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him. Notice what he said, and and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I don't know about you, but I'm glad he didn't say, Behold the Lamb of God who covers up the sin of the world. How many know the Old Testament sacrifices were incomplete at this time? In the Old Testament, the blood of bulls and goats could only temporarily cover sin. But Jesus, when he came, he eradicated sin. He takes the sin of the world away. And when John saw him, when he set his eyes on him, he knew who he was. When you meet Jesus, you'll never be the same. When he saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let us bow for prayer. Father, we love you this morning. God, we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your love for us. God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the Lamb of God who came and bled and died at Calvary to take away the sin of the world. And Father, we pray that you would do what only you can with your word. Father, I acknowledge that I'm just a man. Lord, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody that can save anybody this morning. So Lord, we ask you, God, to do what only you can accomplish through your power and through your strength. Lord, I am weak, I am frail, and I can do nothing apart from you, God. So take your word and do what only you can do. And Father, we'll trust in you In Jesus' name, everybody said, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The centerpiece of all of Scripture is that the Lamb of God, Jesus, would bleed and die on Calvary's hill, that he would be buried and that he would raise again on the third day to take away the sin of the world. That really is the gospel. That really is the centerpiece. That that really is the heart of the Word of God. You've got 66 books. You've got 44 uh, different authors uh, inspired by God. But when you really get down to the meat of the Word of God, when you really get down to the centerpiece, When you really get down to the bullseye, when you really get down to the heart of it, the Word of God is really about Jesus Christ going to the cross, dying for the sins of the world, being buried and raising again on the third day. Folks, that is the gospel. That is the good news that God gave us in His Word. The bad news is is that all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter what your economic status is. It doesn't matter what your color of skin is. It doesn't matter what your gender is. If you're male or you're female. None of that really matters. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How many know that's bad news but Jesus left us with good news. And the good news of the gospel is this. That the Jesus, the Lamb of God, has come to take away the sin of the world. That is the good news that God has called us to share. And it's and, and what Timothy said. He said, there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man. That's the man, Christ Jesus. There's one way to the Father and his name's Jesus. Folks, you're not going to get there by belonging to a church. It's not enough. Say, well, I'm a church member. That'll get me to heaven. It's not enough. Well, I'm a good person. That's that's not enough. The Bible says there's none good. 
There's none that doeth good. There's none righteous. Our righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. Jesus and the blood that he shed is the only way that he can wash away our sins. Like the old hymn writer said, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am so thankful to report to you this morning that that God loved us enough to do something about the bad news. The bad news is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Jesus came, the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. And, And as I begin to journey through the Scripture, through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, and as you look at how many different times that you find a lamb in the Old Testament, and as many times as you find a lamb in the New Testament, that's what I want to highlight. Some, some times that a lamb shows up in Scripture that, that reminds us of Jesus. And so the first thing that I want you to notate, if you're going to take notes, is in Genesis chapter 2, we find a lamb for one man. In Genesis chapter 2, we find a lamb for one man. What, what Genesis chapter 2 is, is where, where God tested Abraham. The Bible says that he tempted Abraham and he asked Abraham to go offer up his son Isaac, whom he loved, uh, on top of Mount Moriah as a sacrifice to God. And so what God was doing was testing Abraham to see if he really loved God more than he loved his son. And so Abraham packs up the, the wood, and, and, and he, he packs up his son, and he takes his son up to Mount Moriah there. And, 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 and I want you to, I, I want to read this to you. Genesis chapter 22, uh, we'll, we'll pick up there, and this is what the Word of God says. Genesis chapter 22, once again, I'm talking about a lamb for one man. In verse number 9, it says, When they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you have not withheld your son, your only son from me and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns and Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering in the stead of his son what Abraham didn't know is that when he was coming up one side of the mountain God had a lamb coming up the other side of the mountain and it was there that God provided a lamb for one man and and, and you say well preacher what are you trying to say this is where God shows concern for you This is where we understand that God loves you as an individual. That God loves me. And and, and listen, for the cross to really become meaningful, it has to become personal. We we think all the time, well, you know, he died for the world. No, he died for you. And this is where a lamb, that God provided a lamb for one man. This This is what theologians describe as the doctrine of substitutionary offering. That means that, that, that God provided a ram in the stead of Isaac. And so the ram died so that Isaac didn't have to. By the way, folks, Jesus died a death that you and I don't have to die on Calvary's Hill. The substitutionary offering for sin is that he took our place. That he that knew no sin became sin for you and I. Listen, Jesus didn't deserve the cross. He is the innocent. He is the spotless Lamb of God. He did, as as Pilate said, when when he stood before Pontius Pilate, when when he looked and and when Pilate examined him and, and looked him up and down, this is what Pilate said of Jesus, I find no fault in this man. Folks, you can look Jesus up and down and you'll find no fault in him. By the way, if you look me up and down, you're going to find fault in me. That's why you don't put your hope and faith in a preacher. I'm not perfect, but Jesus is. You can look the church up and down, and guess what? You're going to find flaws, and you're going to find faults, and you're going to find imperfections. You're going to find things about the church that you don't like. But guess what? That's why your faith and your hope's not placed in the church. Your hope and your faith is to be placed in Jesus Christ, who died for you. The substitutionary offering. And so what we find is a lamb for one man here. And this is amazing. The truth that, that God loves you of all of the people on planet earth. That God, there are over 6 billion people. 
that live on planet earth. And God is concerned about you, that God's mind is upon you. I like what the old writer, uh, the, the, the songwriter, he pinned down some great words. Old southern gospel song. It says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. That gets personal, folks. That means that the cross was for me, that Jesus loves me. And and, and this really, really gets personal. And I I begin to think about Romans uh, chapter 5, and I begin to think about the love of God that he showed for us there at the cross. And this is what Romans chapter 5 says, beginning in verse number 8. The scripture says this. The the word of God says that, that, but God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Listen, for while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. What God is saying is there was no other way for us to have life than for God's son to die. See, listen, there is no way that Isaac could have lived unless a ram died in its stead. Amen. This is the substitutionary offering. This is where literally the lamb took the place of Isaac. And and folks, as you travel through the New Testament, we find the very same thing for you and I. There is no other way for you and I to have eternal life except the lamb died. Jesus is the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. If you believe it, shout a big amen. Amen. I've got to move fast. Genesis chapter 22, it's a lamb for one man. Not only do we find a lamb for one man in Genesis chapter 22, but now let's travel to Exodus chapter 12, and we find a lamb for one family. We find a lamb for a family. Exodus chapter 12 is the uh, account of the Passover. And this is the final plague of the ten that God sent on Pharaoh and the people of Egypt uh, for refusing to let the people of God go. And in, in Exodus chapter 12, what we find is that God said a death angel was going to pass through the land. And the only way for a family to escape the death angel that was going to pass and take the life of the firstborn is that God said you had to take a lamb, and you had to take the blood of the lamb, and you had to uh, apply that with some hyssop. The hyssop is referring to faith. You always have to apply the blood in faith. And, and, and what you have to do, what God set the instructions up, and he was very specific. He said, take the blood of the lamb and apply it with some hyssop on the doorposts and on the lintel of the home. And so what God said is that that when the death angel comes, he says, when when the death angel, when I pass by, he says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood of the lamb, notice the difference that the lamb made for the families in Egypt. When the blood was applied, everybody look right up here, the family was safe and secure inside of the house. But how many know that when the blood wasn't applied, there was no safety and there was no security? How many know that, and and listen, Exodus chapter 12, if you're there, let me read a few verses for you. Exodus chapter 12, listen to what the word of God says. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be for the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses. Notice this, a lamb for a household. A lamb for a household. What God is saying is, not only am I concerned about you as a man or as a woman, but I'm also concerned about your family. God said, I am concerned about your family. Everybody look right up here. God's concerned about your family. God is concerned about your family. And and, and listen, he wanted there to be safety and security through the blood of the lamb. And I want you to notice that that, that those that had the blood applied when the death angel passed by, they were safe and secure. But notice those that did not have the blood of the lamb applied. Listen to me, when they woke up on that morning, their family was filled with emptiness and with misery that morning. Heartache and misery showed up for those that
that didn't have the blood of the Lamb. Listen, everybody look right up here. There's no such thing as a perfect family. But I want you to understand something. If you don't have Jesus Christ in your family, I'm going to tell you something. You're setting yourself up for a lot of heartache and misery. What a difference that the Lamb makes. And listen, Jesus wants to make a difference. Listen, God does not want your family to be full of chaos. God does not want your family to be full of backbiting and bitterness and animosity. And what we're seeing, that the love of many is waxing cold in the end times. And there are families that are being ravaged and being torn apart. And I'm telling you, the only thing that will make a difference is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. And there is a lot of heartache and there's a lot of misery that could be prevented if we'll just put the lamb on the doorpost of our home. If we'll just put our foot down and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, I'm telling you, some of us need to make a declaration today. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We're not going to allow the heartache and the misery to show up here anymore. We're going to put Jesus first and foremost, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What a difference in my 10 years of being a pastor, what a difference that I've seen Jesus make in the life of families. What a difference. When we put Jesus first and foremost in our homes. I'm telling you, listen, Jesus can, the Lamb of God can put your marriage back together. Amen. The Lamb of God can bring conflict and make it peaceful once again. Amen. Boy, it is a, it's a tragedy as a, I'm a Wichita police chaplain and, and I, I, as a pastor deal a lot with the end of life. And, and it is devastating to walk in uh, on the, the hospice floor of a hospital and to be there to counsel families and they hate one another and won't even speak to one another. There are families that absolutely despise one another. Listen, everybody look right up here. The Lamb of God can make a difference right there. And listen, God provided a lamb for the family in Exodus chapter 2 and so he shows the importance, the emphasis that God places on the family. Aren't you thankful that God's concerned about your family. If you believe it, shout a big amen. God provided a lamb for the family. So we see the importance of one man. We see the importance of a family. But now let's go to Leviticus chapter 16. And we'll see a lamb for a nation. We'll see a lamb for a nation. Leviticus chapter 16 is one of the most important chapters in all of the Bible. It's what we refer to as the day of atonement or Yom Kippur. The Day of Atonement is the day that the high priest would enter into the holiest of holies in the temple. And it would be there that he would take the blood of the lamb that had been slaughtered. And he would go beyond the veil. See, you had three different areas in the temple. You had, and, and, and only the high priest was allowed into the holiest of holies. The most holy place. It was separated by the veil. By the way, that's the same veil that, died, that when Jesus died was rent in two. That we could now all uh, have access to the high priest, Jesus Christ, through the death of Jesus. And so, this, th- you have this, this great big veil uh, that was there. And then you have the holiest of holies and the most holy place. And what the high priest would do one day a year is that he would take the blood that had been applied from uh, the blood from the lamp. And he would take it and there was an important piece of furniture in the most holy place. It was the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is symbolic of the presence of God. Part of the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat. And what the high priest was to do is that he was to take the blood of the lamb and sprinkle it on the mercy seat so that the wrath of God could be satisfied for one more year for the nation of Israel. But what we have here is that a lamb that had been provided by God for an entire nation. What, what the high priest did is that he was interceding not just for a man, not just for a family, but he was interceding for the entire nation of Israel on the Day of Atonement. He was going into the very presence of God and sprinkling the blood so that the entire nation of Israel could be blessed for another year. Everybody look right up here. God is still concerned about nations. 
God is still concerned about nations. And I believe that God is still concerned about the United States of America. And I have a news flash for somebody in here this morning. Donald Trump cannot make America great again. Only Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, can make America great again. There is no man that can make America great again. Only Jesus, the Lamb of God, who shed his blood on Calvary, can make our nation great again. The Bible says in Psalms 33 and 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. I'm telling you, we talk a lot about wanting God to bless America. Well, I think it's time to turn the tables a little bit. I think it's time for America to start blessing God. I think it's time for us to start honoring God again. Listen, it's not a good time to start kicking God out of our schools. It's not a good time in our day and age to start saying Bibles aren't welcome in our schools anymore. Prayer is not welcome in our schools anymore. It's not a good time for to start taking the Ten Commandments out of the courthouses. Listen, we need God in the White House. We need God in the school house we need God back in the courthouse we need God in America again and God provided a lamb for the nation God provide listen I believe there's hope for America but it's not going to be in a president it's going to be in a king and his name's King Jesus King Jesus amen I will lift up mine eyes under the hills From whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Listen to me. I'm telling you that I am thankful for the United States of America. I am thankful uh, for all of our veterans. I am thankful for those. By the way, let's just honor our veterans this morning. If you've served in the armed forces, would you stand at this time so that we can honor you and and give the Lord thanks uh, for our veterans? Go ahead and stand. Go ahead and stand at this time. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you for your service. Gary, I met Gary. Gary's sitting on the back row here. I'm sorry to uh, to embarrass you. I met Gary at Walmart this week, and uh, he's a veteran. And uh, Gary, I want you to know how how thankful I am for you to be here this morning. I appreciate your service uh, for our country, and thank you so much for joining us this morning, and we just appreciate you. Amen. Absolutely. Praise the Lord. God bless you, brother. God bless you. God provided a lamb for a nation. God is still concerned about the nations. God has a heart for nations. I'm thankful for missionaries that get a burden for nations. Because it's not just America God's interested in. He's interested in all the nations. Amen. So we see... In Genesis chapter two or 22, God provided a lamb for one man. In Exodus chapter 12, God provided a lamb for a family. In Leviticus chapter 16, we find that God provided a lamb for a nation. Back to John chapter 1, God brings it all together in the New Testament that God provided a lamb for the world. God provided a lamb for the world. See, God just doesn't love the individual. God just doesn't love the family. God just doesn't love the nation. God loves the world. For God so loved the that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is where we see in John chapter 1, John the Baptist had it right. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin, not of the individual, not of the family, not of the nation, but takes away the sin of the world. If you'll look to Jesus and look to him by faith, he'll take away the sin of the world. He is the Lamb of God. He is the hope of the world. We cry out for world peace. Listen, there'll never be world peace until the Prince of Peace is put back in rightful place in this world. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's the one, he's the mighty conqueror who can bring peace in the midst of any chaotic situation. But Jesus Christ died for the world. It's our mission. It's everyone everywhere. It's every kindred, every tongue, every tribe, every race. It's every skin color. It's every economic status. It's every gen. Listen, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter if you've been in jail or if you've been out of jail. It doesn't matter if you've been a, a, a good person or a bad person. Listen to me. We're all in the same boat. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. I'm telling you that Jesus is the Lamb for the world 
He loves the world that he created. But we live in a sin-cursed, fallen world. We live, this is, this is why it's so hard to believe, because we see the damaging effects of sin everywhere that we look. It's depressing to watch television. It's depressing to watch the news. Many don't even read the newspaper anymore because it's all negativity. It's all the side effects of the sin-cursed, fallen world that we live in. And until Jesus comes, we're going to continue to deal with these side effects of the sin-cursed, fallen world. But I'm telling you that Jesus is the Lamb who can take away the sin of the world. The side effects will still remain, but here's what you have to understand. Jesus Christ will, give us, will promise us a home, a home in heaven because he'll take away our sin. And that's what's important. Not what's done in this life, but what matters is the life that is to come. Amen. This life is temporary. James put it this way. This life is but a vapor. It's here and it's gone. Here and it's gone. Anybody in here 60 years of age? You 60 years of age? Has it, been, has it went by that fast? It's a vapor. Life is but a vapor. And part, part of our problem in this life is that we get too temporal minded and we get, we get distracted and we, we get sidetracked from the life that really matters and that's the life to come. This life is but a vapor. This life is temporary and we're only here for a short time. God has promised us eternal life. Don't let the side effects of sin, I, I want to say this and I'm done. Don't let the side effects of the sin cursed fallen world keep you from the Lamb of God who died from the world. See, what the, enemy wants to does, what the enemy wants to do is he wants to blind your mind from the side effects of a sin-cursed fallen world. Listen to me, there is a price to pay for leaving God out. Adam and Eve left God out of their decisions, and there's a price to pay for that. Listen to me, when, when people leave God out of their decisions, there's a, the Bible says, whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. They that sow to the flesh shall reap corruption, but they that sow to the Spirit shall reap life everlasting. It's the law of harvest. Take it to the bank. Whatever a man sows, that shall he reap. Whatever a nation sows, that shall they reap. Whatever a family sows, that shall they reap. It is the law of harvest. You can't undo it. You can't stop it. It's God's law. But here's the thing. You can't stop seed that's been sown in the past, but you can start sowing new seed. There are some that have been dealing for, for, for their entire life sowing bad seed, and all they're getting is a bad harvest. Guess what? God's saying it's time to start sowing some new seed. Because if you start sowing some new seed, before too long, you keep watering that seed, and you keep fertilizing that seed, guess what? You're going to get a different harvest. You're going to get a different outcome. You're going to get some different results. See, some people, they want different results in life, but they keep doing the same thing that they've always done. Listen, that's insanity. That's the definition of insanity. Doing the same things you, you've always done, but expecting different results. It doesn't work that way. It's not the law of harvest. It's not what God said. God said, whatever man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to get a, a, a harvest of corruption. But if you start sowing to the Spirit, you're going to reap life everlasting. In spite of any type of harvest in your life, Jesus wants to be the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Amen? And, and, and here's what, what I have to say, and I'm done. God has provided the Lamb. In every case, Genesis chapter 22, God provided the Lamb. Exodus chapter 12, for the family, God provided the lamb. Leviticus chapter 16, on the day of atonement, God provided the lamb. John chapter 1, when Jesus shows up on the scene, God provided the lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, to take away the sin of the world. What are you trying to say today, preacher? God loves you. God loves you enough to provide for you a lamb. The question is, what will you do with the lamb? What will you do with the lamb? That's the question we all give an account for when we stand before the Lord. What have you done with my lamb? What have you done with the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you let him purge you? Did you let him take away your sin? Or did you become your own king in life? God's a gentleman. He won't force himself to serve you. 
God will not force you to make him Lord over your life. It's a powerful thing God gave man when he gave him a free will. You can harden your heart or you can soften your heart and say yes to the Lord Jesus. You can bow yourself in humility or you can resist him in your pride. It's your choice. God has provided the lamb. John chapter 1. John the Baptist was baptizing. He looks out and he sees him coming from a long ways away, recognizes him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's thank God for the Lamb today. Let's bow for prayer.